Hello and welcome back to Family Law and More. We are your hosts. I'm Lisa Edmonds. And I'm Isabel Hawkins. And today we are again joined by Daniel Thomas from Chroma, which is the UK's only national provider of the creative arts therapies. Daniel, welcome back. Thank you very much. And if listeners haven't already listened to part one of our two-part podcast episode, go and do that. It was a fascinating discussion that we had with you last time, and we're delighted that you've agreed to come back and join us for part two. Now, in the first episode, you referenced the assessment tool that Chroma use, and I just want to do a bit of a deep dive into that with you. So can you tell us a bit more about that tool and how it's used to assess parent-child interactions? Absolutely. So First of all, it was created by an amazing, she's now the Associate Professor at Aalborg University in Denmark, Dr. Stina Jakobsen. And she was in a family protection, child protection sort of residential setting, wanting to find out a way of measuring attunement and attachment and nonverbal communication with the parents and the children. This is going back to 2007. And as part of her PhD, she created the assessment of parent-child interaction. Um, In 2013, I think it was, I went to Denmark and trained to be an APCI assessor and thought, wow, this is a really important tool that is strength-based, which is, I think, massively important. It gives families the benefit of the doubt. So I use that term to mean it's opportunities for them to show us the best of, of how they interact rather than feeling you know, I'm being assessed here. Yeah. And I think the magic of what she's done and the, I mean, in the UK, we've done more than 350 APCIs over the last 10 years. So it's something that we've used an awful lot. But the magic of the way that the the tool's analysis works is that it uses musical events. So getting louder, stopping, starting as ways to measure interaction. And it's the the sort of the psychometrics and the way that those psychometrics then align themselves with standardized parenting questionnaires that makes the tool valid. We know that we're measuring what we think we're measuring and we're measuring it at the sort of the, the strength that we want to be measuring it at. So it's it's hugely useful, hugely important. As I say, you know, for us it's it's a key part of how we work with adoptive children and their families. And it's always a parent and a child. So if there are two children in a family, we would do two APCIs, if you see what I mean. So it's always parent and always child. Okay. And what does the assessment plan look like? So you've got a parent and a child. If you were undertaking an assessment for the purposes of court proceedings, would you want to see the court papers? Would you want to better understand the history? How many sessions would you have with parent and child, would you do sessions individually as well as yeah. together? Just talk us through that. So it's it's a very fixed protocol. It's two 30-minute sessions about a week apart, and the parent and the child do the same five activities. They are easy musical exercises. So, for example, turn-taking is one of the, the exercises. Leading and following is an exercise and free play is an exercise. So it's structured exactly the same way. In terms of previous, you know, do we want to read reports? That can be helpful for the therapist to have in their mind, but it's not going to be part of what influences the assessment. It's videoed. Each of the the two sessions that are a week apart are videoed. We do the analysis on the second assessment again because we're giving families the benefit of the doubt they're going to be more relaxed the second time they know what to expect so that's a helpful way of doing it and then the report details it comes up with one of 16 profiles and then there's obviously the therapist's professional opinion exploring that in a little bit more detail but essentially we're looking at non-verbal communication you think that 90% of communication is non-verbal yeah um, if that parent-child pair are able to pick up nonverbal cues successfully, then that's a really important thing. We're looking at their attachment patterns. We're looking at the parent's ability to respond to the emotional needs of the child, looking at child autonomy. So there are four key, you know, key things that the assessment picks up. And I have to say within, you know, the, the 350 so that we've done around the country commissioned through local authorities, the APCI has become a really, really well understood and I think hugely useful thing 
and we get repeat commissions. So it is obviously proving helpful to social workers and, and parents. It's also then useful around uh, how we would work in terms of ongoing treatment. So we can put a treatment plan together based on the areas of strength and based on the areas of weakness that the APCI has shown us. And we can come back six months later and repeat the APCI assessment and okay. see, see that sort of change in those areas. So is it the same person that will undertake the 30 minute sessions and then analyze and evaluate and then deliver the program of therapy identified or is it a mix of individuals? We would always, I mean, yeah, for, for therapeutic integrity, we have APCI certified assessors that go in and do the, the assessment, the video analysis, the report writing, and then put together a treatment plan. And then there's always another therapist that has that long-term therapeutic yeah, relationship yeah, good. with the clients. Obviously, if we're asked to come back and reassess, it would be the, yes. the APCI assessor that comes back in. But once that treatment starts, we want the the, um, the therapist and, and, and the, the kids and the parents to, to really develop that relationship um, with, with the treating therapist. I love the idea that you give the family a warm-up exercise almost before <laughs> doing it for real. I mean, a bit like totally. doing this podcast, yeah, you, yeah. Know, you know, we before we've best gone conversations. live. Yeah, exactly. But well, it's uh, so important. And, and I think, you know, again, the what, what's really important about APCI and how it feels is that we, you know, part of that process of, of the assessment is, is then asking the mums and the dads and the children for their you know, point of view on it. What was it nice to take part in? What did you see? Um, have you got any reflections? And again, it's it's so rare to get uh, a family that says, I really hated it. It was super scary. I mean, they may say, yeah, the session, first session was a bit nerve wracking because they're meeting someone for the first time. They're playing musical instruments like drums or, or the xylophone for the first time. So that can be a bit you know, raise anxiety, but it's not like being grilled and assessed under a microscope in a weird room with a person asking weird questions. No. And I think that's where it can provide courts, it can provide solicitors, it can provide social workers with such valuable information about the nonverbal communication, about the capacity of parents to read the emotions of their kids. And if they can't, then that's an area that, that we can really successfully then work on. So you mentioned last time that you work with adoptive families and children. So when you're commissioned by the local authority for this assessment, is this working with adopted children or is this working with children before they are at that stage or may never be at that stage? Absolutely. So APCI was designed, as I say, from a child protection context in terms of that that was the centre in Denmark that started Stina thinking about how to assess. You can use it with, you know, children and families at a whole range of reasons. It's designed for kids between five and 12. We sometimes use it with slightly older kids when developmentally they're working at a slightly younger chronological mm. age. That might be because of, uh, you know, a brain condition or, or um, a whole range of reasons. With ourselves, it, it's part, it fits into a sort of multi-therapist assessment that, that we do. Um, and that's always with, with adoptive families and or sort of foster carers. But we have used it, you know, with, with families where there are other things going on and, it, and it's been commissioned just to give us that, that sense of, you know, what is going on non-verbally and with, you know, the other things that it looks at. So this assessment's never been used as part of what we would call just a standard parenting assessment as part of court proceedings? Not that I'm aware of in the UK. So in the UK, Chroma have the exclusive license, which we were really keen to get because it has allowed us to develop that deep experience of, of working. I think it's an opportunity actually for, for family law to, to look at this because if I can take an awful stereotype where you've got a mum who says, I think I should have the kids because they've got a great relationship with me and they don't know their daddy's never there, all that sort of stuff. What it could be used for is as actually to do an APCI with mum and ch child, children, and with dad and child and children. And it may there show that actually they both have a really nice relationship. 
that both parents can attune to the needs of their child, that they both can read those nonverbal cues. It's not, again, we wouldn't want to use it in a divisive way because I think unless there are child protection concerns, parents and, and kids need to have access to each other and need, need to be able to, to share their lives together in that way. So by bringing it into family law, which I think is, the, is a you know, big opportunity, we, we can start to, to actually say, you know, these, these interactions are healthy mm. and there's areas that we can work on and, and that's, you know, that's the treatment side of it. But it, it can be used, as I say, to just sort of bring to light where the strengths are, where the areas of need are, and then we can, you know, work, work mm. to sort of restore those. On our next episode of Family Law and More, we'll be joined by Dr. Kate Helene, a consultant chartered psychologist who will give the experts response to some of the issues we raised in our second episode of Family Law and More when we discuss the current approach with Part 25 applications for expert assessments in the family courts. Subscribe so you don't miss out. So in family law at the moment, there's a big push to move away from expert assessments. And in any case, the legal test is that the assessment needs to be necessary. And practitioners often find it difficult to convince the court that any assessment is necessary. But it sounds to me like there may be a real role for this assessment and this work before parents come to court in a, in a private sort of child custody battle. Mm. And actually, it could really help prevent them from ever getting to court in the first place. Absolutely. And you, you think of that sort of push towards mediation. Yes. Um, ra- rather than, you know, driving headlong in, in into the sort of court. Again, you know, y- using it successfully to, to showcase actually, you know, that th- there is a high level of functioning between, you know, the, the parents and the children in this particular family. These are reasons to, to work therapeutically rather than, you know, much more sort of competitively around, a, you know, a court proceedings where you've got winners and losers, clearly. We're, we're wanting to make sure that there are no winners and losers and, and everyone gets their voice heard. Mm. It's really interesting because it fits with the whole alternative dispute resolution model that Absolutely. we're being encouraged yep. to embrace and with, with more enthusiasm and that collaborative approach. Mm. And I'm just thinking of, like Isabel's just mentioned, our sort of private law cases and those situations where one parent has been absent from a child's life for for whatever reason. But within the court process, we've now got a decision that child needs to reconnect and rebuild with that absent parent. And it's such a critical part if not the most critical part of decision making because it's make or break and you've got to get it right for it to have the long-term success and I think sometimes that's where we fall apart a little bit because you're looking for resources that just aren't there and you're wanting to find resources that match the needs of that child that family in in particular And usually by the time we've got that critical decision from the court, they're ready to sort of pack up and send the family off to then implement whatever the decision is. And the family lack that support and that scaffolding about how to nurture decision and and help it grow. So I'm just wondering in terms of your services may be forming part of what I would term an exit strategy for families and helping a child and and that absent parent find a safe way or a safe start point. Have you had experience of that? Yeah, and I think I would I would talk about the context of when we're working in adoptive families at that really early stage where you yeah. are bringing strangers together. Yeah, and I, I think the the creative arts therapies generally, but certainly. APCI and then that sort of music therapy treatment model helps us to identify again the strengths and the the areas of need of that parent and, and like you said that absent the absent parent and the child trying to reconnect so what can we build on where do we need to to focus our attention mm. in terms of the ongoing treatment work and I was thinking on the train up here you know things like um, supervised visits and and things like that it's the most unnatural way yeah. to be together yeah. <laughs> in a horrible room with weird play objects that are not yours yeah somebody watching and all those sort of things it's just hugely unnatural 
But what I think the creative arts therapies can do is really structure those interactions, give opportunity for playfulness, normality, fun, which is a really misunderstood and Mm -hmm. undervalued thing. Because I think, again, thinking about the neurochemicals that are released when we're enjoying ourselves, oxytocin, which is the sort of the bonding chemical that we all have when we're connected with with people. All of those sort of things happen through play and, and music, art and drama therapy can really engender that. Yeah. And we're, we're giving people agency and decision-making powers and, and choice. And I yeah. think, again, from a therapist's point of view, we're also able to model, you know, ways of, of being, which the parent can pick up on, which the child can pick up on. Isabel was talking earlier about, um, you know, attunement and self-regulation. Mm. So we can model all of those behaviours in a very pro-social way. I think as an exit strategy, you've hit on a great idea. Yeah. Well, I'm going back years ago. There used to be a great organisation in um, Salford called Pro Contact. And I remember being involved in a few cases where, again, in that scenario of, of reconnecting or, as you say, introducing for the first time mm. an adult and a child, And they used to have a room that was divided into two and they used to have a hatch. So the child would come in with, I mean, it was a support worker rather than a therapist and child would be encouried to paint a picture or do do something fun and creative. And then the worker would say, do you know who's on the other side? And there'd then be a discussion, talking generally now, it's your dad on the other side. How would you feel if I just open the hatch and pass him the picture? So again, there's no sort of anticipation of seeing someone or Mm. hearing someone for the first time or um, for the first time in a long time. And then it would be, shall we ask your dad to maybe draw you a picture back? And that would be the end of the first session. And it's only once you sort of followed that journey through to the end point. So you may be on session number eight, where then the magic really kicks in. Um, But you wouldn't have got to that point without just nurturing in a really sensitive way um, the start point. And I find it really sad that um, up until sort of um, connecting with you, Daniel, and hearing about Chroma, that that type of um, service just wasn't available I mean, I suppose in the current climate, those services that are out there come at a cost, so they're not going to be accessible for every family. But I think if there are some families out there that we could marry up with your service as part of that exit strategy, I think that has huge potential. Speaking for myself, I don't know what Isabel thinks. No, absolutely. Because that's that's the problem in so many cases, isn't it? We do such intense work with these families while they're in proceedings and then once the final hearing's there that's it we're no longer involved Kafka are no longer involved the court aren't and they're just left to their own devices and it's a big ask particularly if it's a particularly acrimonious relationship yeah. you know it's a big ask to expect them to just put all their differences aside even if it is for their child that that's a hard thing to do and um, so I think there's a massive market there for for services post proceedings. And I think again, you you provide that expert involvement through the the law, uh, the legal proceedings. And then I think absolutely you're right then to think how how can we transition? How can we bridge that into when you're not around and what the family now need is something completely different. So a therapeutic approach can be really helpful. And I think it's then about and certainly with Cromo we're always aware that work has to come to an end. Um, So how can we embed the positive aspects of therapy in that family's everyday life? Because we're with them for an hour a week or two hours a week. We want, you know, to make a difference around the breakfast table. Mm -hmm. We want to make a difference on the bus when they're going to school. Um, And I think we're very focused on ways in which we can, we can take what happens in the therapy room and then plant it back into the, the everyday life of the family and, you know, involve yeah, parents and children in, in activities that they can then carry on because that's that's really where the benefit needs to show up is, is their everyday life. Mm. Well, Daniel, thank you so, so much. It really has been enjoyable and My fascinating. Pleasure. thank you. Um, yes. And I hope um, sometime soon you'll come and join us again because Love it's to. definitely an area that has, I think, grabbed our attention and definitely uh, more discussions to be had. But for now, thank you. And Thanks, Daniel. Isabel, turning to you, 
despite having hosted now a number of podcasts, you've managed to escape our game of roll that dice. But I'm pleased to tell our listeners that it's Isabel's turn today. <laughs> so when you are ready, roll that dice. Okay, here we go. Fun fact. Oh. <laughs> um, you have got a fun fact. This is going to be Roger's favourite fun fact. <laughs> or maybe I should choose this one. Is it a fun fact about you? Yes. Excellent. So when I was a student, first time around, I was a backing dancer for Bass Hunter. Woo-woo. <laughs> that's it, I think that's really. a very cool fun fact. Now, it was only for one show. Um, but yeah, it was fun. It was very hot, though, because the facilities people had put had tried to put the air con on, but had actually put the heating on. And it was the middle of summer and I was dancing like a, you know, going for it on the stage. And it, it was probably the hottest I've ever been. So that's what sticks in the mind. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us. And that brings this episode to an end. In our next episode, we will be joined by Dr. Kate Hillin, a consultant chartered psychologist who will give the experts response to some of the issues we raised in our second episode on family law and more when we discuss the current approach with Part 25 applications for expert assessments in the family court. So please, listeners, join us then. Thank you for listening. Remember to subscribe and leave a review. And any questions, send them into podcast at unit.law. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Daniel. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.